All right. So, so far we saw how we could frame control as inference in a particular graphical model. And then we talked about how we could do exact inference in that graphical model uh, and understand three possible inference problems, computing backward messages, computing policies, which uses those backward messages, and computing forward messages, which, as I've alluded to, will be useful later on when we talk about inverse reinforcement learning. Now, all of the inference procedures we've discussed so far have been exact inference. But, uh, of course, in complex, high-dimensional or continuous state spaces, or settings where the dynamics are not known, where the transition probabilities are not available to us, and we can only sample from them by performing rollouts, we need to do approximate inference. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the next section. I'll actually use the tools that we learned about from last week, the tools of variational inference, to show how model-free reinforcement learning procedures can be derived from this control as inference framework. Now, in the course of uh, designing these approximate algorithms, we're also going to see how we can devise a solution to a particular problem that I raised previously, and that's the optimism problem that I mentioned. So if you recall from the previous part of the lecture, we talked about how the state backward message and the state action backward message their logarithms can be interpreted as being very similar to value functions and Q functions. And we, when we write out these equations in log space, we derive a, an algorithm that looks very similar to value iteration, except the max over the actions is replaced with a soft max, and the Bellman backup has a log expected value exponential form. Now, the soft max is not really that much of a problem. That's actually where we get this uh, notion of soft optimality, so we actually want that. Uh, but this kind of backup is a little bit problematic. The trouble with this backup is that the log of the expected value of the exponentiated next state values is going to be dominated by the luckiest state. Uh, the easiest way to see this is to imagine that uh, the action corresponds to buying a lottery ticket. So you have a one in a thousand chance of uh, getting an extremely large payoff and a 999 in a thousand chance of getting nothing. Now, the effect uh, of this will be that the, the expected value is, you know, zero times 0.9999 and uh, one million times 0 0.001. So that means that it's just one million times 0 0.001. When you take the uh, exponential of that and then the logarithm, the zeros, their effect will essentially disappear and the final value will be dominated by that positive outcome. And that's really bad news because, of course, buying the lottery ticket is not a good idea and its expected value is not high, but its log expected uh, exponentiated value is high. So essentially this kind of backup results in a kind of optimism bias. Now, why does this happen? Well, the inference problem that we're solving is to infer the most likely trajectory given optimality. And then marginalizing and conditioning this, we get the policy P of AT given ST comma O1 through capital T. Uh, the question intuitively that this inference problem is asking is, given that you obtained high reward, what was your action probability? Now think back to the lottery example. If you know that you got a million dollars, that makes it more likely that you played the lottery. That doesn't mean that playing the lottery is a good idea. So fundamentally, the tension here is that the inference question we're asking is not quite the, the question to which we really want the answer. What we want to know is what would you have done if you were trying to be optimal, not what do I think you did, given that you got a million bucks? The issue that this really stems from is that the posterior probability of st plus 1 given st, at, and o1 through capital T is not the same as its prior probability. So when we perform this inference process, we're actually altering the dynamics to agree with our evidence. Again, the intuition here follows very nicely from the lottery example. If you know that you got a million bucks and you bought the lottery ticket, 
there's a higher probability that you won the lottery. Because the evidence that you got a million bucks increases the belief that you actually won the lottery. But of course, the dynamics are not allowed to change in reality. In reality, we'd like to uh, figure out what is a approximately optimal thing to do in the actual original dynamics. So this question uh, is, given that you obtained higher reward, what was your transition probability? But in a sense, we don't care about this question. We, your transition probability should remain fixed. So let's think about how we can address this optimism problem. So what we want is we want the policy, but we don't want our process of inferring the policy to allow us to change the dynamics. So intuitively what we want is, given that you obtained high reward, what was your action probability, given that your transition probabilities did not change? So one of the ways that we could approach this is we could say, can we find an, another distribution um, Q over states and actions that is close to the posterior over states and actions given O1 through T, but has the same original dynamics. So in this uh, approximate posterior Q, we want the dynamics to be the same uh, as, as they were originally, unaffected by the, uh, your knowledge of the reward, but we want the action probabilities to change. So where have we seen this before? Where have we seen the notion of approximating one probability distribution with another one that has some constraints? So if for a minute we say that X is O1 through capital T and Z is S1 through T and A1 through T, then this problem is equivalent to saying find Q of Z to approximate P of Z given X basically find an approximate distribution that accurately approximates the posterior over unobserved variables. And that is basically the problem that variational inference solves. So can we shoehorn this problem? Can we find another distribution QS1 through T, A1 through T, that is close to the posterior P, but has the dynamics P of ST plus 1 given ST T? Can we shoehorn this into the framework of variational inference? Take a few moments to think about this. Think about how you could use variational inference to address this. Maybe pause the video and think about it. And then check your, your answer against what I'm going to tell you on the next slide. All right. So what we're going to do in order to perform control using variational inference is we'll define a somewhat peculiar distribution class for Q. We'll define Q of S1 through T and A1 through T as the product of P of S1, the product of the transition probabilities P of ST plus 1 given ST AT at every time step, and an action distribution Q of AT given ST. Now this distribution, this definition for the variational distribution is quite peculiar because typically when we use variational inference, we learn the entire variational distribution. But here, we're actually fixing some parts of the variational distribution to be the same as P, and only learning the action conditional. So we're going to have the same dynamics and the same initial state as P. And that's going to be important for combating this optimism bias. So the only thing that we learned for learning this approximate uh, posterior is Q of AT given ST. We can represent this graphically as follows. The real graphical model that we are, in which we are trying to do inference is shown here. So we have the observed variables, O1 through capital T, and the unobserved variables, the S's and the A's. So we have the initial state, the transition probabilities, and the optimality variable probabilities. The uh, approximation corresponds to this graphical model. So remember, in variational inference, the uh, variational distribution does not contain the observed variables, so it makes sense that the O's are removed, only the S's and A's remain. And we have the same initial state distribution, the same transition probabilities. We no longer have the O's, but instead we have Q of AT given ST. And that's the only part that we're going to learn. By the way, as an aside, I should mention that all of these derivations 
I presented for the case where S1 is unobserved. Oftentimes, you might actually know S1, in which case P of S1 goes away, the S1 node will be shaded everywhere, and it will not actually be represented as part of your variational distribution. Uh, it's very straightforward to derive that. It just adds a little bit more clutter to the notation, which is why I, I omit that on these slides and treat S1 as a latent variable. But keep in mind that if you are in a situation where you know the current state and you just want to figure out future states and actions, then S1 would be observed. But it's pretty easy to extend this to that setting, and I would encourage you to do that as a whole, as an exercise on your own time. Okay, so. Now, to tie this back to the variational inference discussion from last week, again, we're going to say x, our observed variables, is just O1 through T. Z, our latent variables, correspond to S1 through T and A1 through T. So the first graphical model is P of Z given X. The second one is Q of Z. And, uh, and then we're going to write out our variational lower bound in terms of these things. And then we will optimize that variational lower bound. And we'll see that actually corresponds very closely to a lot of our algorithms that we've already learned about. Okay, so here's the variational lower bound that we saw in the lecture last week. The log probability of x is greater than or equal to the expected value under q of z of log p of x comma z and minus log q of z. And this is actually true for any q of z, but of course, uh, as we learned last week, uh, the closer Q of Z is to the posterior P of Z given X, the tighter this bound becomes. And this, uh, this last term is just the entropy of Q. So substituting in our definitions for X and Z from the previous slide, we can say, well, let Q be equal to this thing. And then we can write out log P of O1 through T, the log probability of our evidence, as being greater than or equal to the expected value under S1 through T and A1 through T distributed according to Q of all of the probabilities in our graphical model, log P of S1 plus the sum of the log probabilities of the transitions plus the sum of the log probabilities of the optimality variables minus the entropy, which is uh, going to be minus log P of S1. So this, this S1 comes from our definition for Q minus the log probabilities of the transitions. Again, this comes from our definition for Q, and then minus the log Q of AT given ST. So now we can see why we made this particular choice for Q. We chose Q so that the initial state probabilities and the transition probabilities very conveniently cancel out, which means that our bound now just corresponds to the sum of the log probabilities of the optimality variables minus the log probabilities of the actions under Q. Substituting in the definition for P of OT given S, T, A, T, we get this expression. The lower bound on our likelihood is just the expected value of the total reward minus log Q, A, T given S, T at every time step. Uh, and I can move the, ex the sum outside of the expectation by linearity of expectation and replace the log Q term with an entropy and now we can see that this lower bound is exactly equivalent to maximizing the reward and maximizing the action entropy. And remember that Q has the same initial state distribution and transition probabilities as the original problem, which means that this is precisely the expected reward, our original reinforcement learning objective, plus these additional entropy terms and the additional entropy terms serve to justify why you don't want just the single optimal solution, but why you might want some stochastic behavior that also models things that are slightly suboptimal. Thinking back to the suboptimal monkey, this is optimizing the subjective will basically give us the suboptimal monkey. So the cool thing about this is just by applying the variational lower bound, we recovered an objective that looks very much like the original reinforcement learning objective, but with the addition of these uh, additional entropy terms. Okay, so how can we optimize this variational lower bound? So there's our Q, there's our bound from the last slide. Take a moment to think about how we could optimize it. Can we, for example, employ some of the algorithms that we already learned about from the previous lectures? So one of the things we could do uh, is we could employ dynamic programming approach. 
So uh, similarly to you know, the value iteration style methods we learned about, we could solve for the last time step, uh, which just has a single reward function. Uh, and when solving for the last time step, we uh, can group the terms. So we have the expected value of S capital T under Q of S capital T uh, of the expected value of A capital T of the reward plus the entropy. Uh, and you could actually show that any time you have a maximization objective, which has the form of uh, the expected value under a distribution of some quantity minus the log probability of that distribution, the solution always has the form of the exponential of that, of that quantity. It's pretty easy to show this by just uh, setting the derivatives, to, you know, taking the derivative, setting the derivative to zero, and solving for Q A capital T given S capital T. But in general, it's a good rule of thumb that if your objective is the expected value of something minus the log probability of the thing under which you're taking the expected value, the solution is always the, expect the exponentiation of that quantity. So the last time step is always optimized when Q of A capital T given ST is proportional to the exponential of the last time step reward. Uh, and in particular, if we write out the normalization you can see that the denominator is just the integral over all actions of the exponentiated reward, which, of course, is exactly the exponentiation of the Q function minus the value function. Of course, on the last time step, the Q function is kind of trivial. The Q function is just the reward, and the value function is just the log integral exponent exponentiation of the Q function, which is the normalizing constant. All right, so that's the value function. Um, now, if I were to um, then substitute it in this expression for Q, uh, then I, uh, I know that the difference between R and log Q is just the value, right? Because log Q, uh, log little Q is going to be big Q minus V. So big Q here is R, so R minus R plus V, I end up with these expression on the right side. So uh, this is somewhat analogous to what we did in LQR. We're starting at the back, solving for the optimal policy, and then substituting in the corresponding expression. So what this tells us is that for the last time step, the contribution this last time step makes to the overall objective is V of S capital T, where little q of at given st is given by this expression. Um, and then we can proceed with the recursive case. We can say that at any given time step, uh, the q of a little t given st at that time step is the arg max of the expected value under q of st of the expected value under q of at given st of the reward at that time step plus the expected value of the value function at the next time step plus the entropy of q of at given st. And of course, uh, if we do that, uh, we can always say that we have this quantity QT STAT, which is R plus next V. That's just the regular Bellman backup, which is not optimistic anymore. And we substitute that into this equation. And again, we get an expression that looks like the expected value under Q of ATST of some quantity minus log Q. So we know that again, the solution is the exponentiated Q value and the normalizer is again the value function. Uh, so again, we have the same expression for Q of AT given ST, and we can repeat this recursion backwards in time. So this gives us a dynamic programming solution. Uh, and of course, we can uh, formalize this as a backward pass, and here's the summary of that backward pass. From the last time step until the beginning, set your Q function to be R plus the expected value of next V. So this is the regular Bellman backup. Set your V to, to be the soft max, so this is the soft uh, maximum. And just like in the regular value iteration algorithm, we would repeat these backups. Now we have a soft value iteration algorithm where everything is exactly the same, except that V is a soft max rather than a hard max, and the final policy is the exponential of Q minus V. Okay, so to summarize this, we have our original model. We made a variational approximation. Our value functions at every step are the log integral of the exponentiated Q values. Our Q values are backed up normally, like in the regular Bellman backup. 
Um, and you can read more about this uh, in this uh, tutorial article from 2018 called Reinforcing Learning and Control as Probabilistic Inference, Tutorial and Review. Uh, but this basically gets us a dynamic programming algorithm that is a soft analog to value generation. Now, there are many variants of this. You could, for example, construct a discounted variant where uh, you put a gamma in front of the expected uh, value of the next value function. And that just corresponds to changing your dynamics to have a 1 minus gamma probability of death. Uh, you could also add an explicit temperature. So when you perform this value function co computation, you can add an alpha where you multiply your Q value by 1 over alpha and then multiply the result by alpha at the end. And as alpha goes to zero, this will approach a hard max. Of course, you can also construct an infinite horizon formulation of this, where instead of literally doing dynamic programming from the end of the structure to the beginning, you actually run an infinite horizon soft value iteration procedure. And that's also a perfectly reasonable, perfectly correct thing to do for the infinite horizon case. It basically works exactly as you would expect, exactly according to the procedure outlined on this slide. Okay, so that's the dynamic programming way of doing um, control as variational inference. Uh, in the next uh, part, I'm going to talk about uh, how to instantiate this idea as well as some other ideas to design some practical RL algorithms that utilize this variational inference formalism.